Okie dokie. Yep. Thank you. Start bang on time. Okay, so um, we were extending our um, arguments about um, reflect uh, about reflection and transmission, and we extended beyond normal incidents, and we're now looking at oblique incidents, and we were splitting our discussion in between dielectrics and conductors. So our dielectric situation, remember all of this is about uh, applying our boundary conditions, and this is a precursor to some of the stuff we're going to be talking about with regard to waveguides later, okay? So we, we kind of need to go through it. So we had our diagram that showed the, uh, to begin with, not necessarily equal theta i and theta r for our incident plane waves. These are, again, these are monochromatic, incident at a certain frequency. Oh, I'm sorry, it must turn itself off, sorry about that. Weird. Where's it gone? That. Oh. Well. Okay, that's weird. Try that. Ah. Sorry about that. It's all right. People latecomers are going to see it now, aren't they? Uh, here we go. Okay. So we had our we had our diagram. Um, so we had a plane wave coming in, it had some frequency, that's our constant over the, the whole system. We had a reflected wave, we had a transmitted wave where the K vectors are, are perpendicular to the wave fronts. We had the two media where we conventionally say that medium two is going to be a high density medium one, but not always. And we described the electric field, we zoom in a little bit, we described the electric field for each of the components in terms of a common frequency omega and some phase term. Let's zoom in a bit more. There's a phase. There's a bit of echo here. Isn't there? There's a phase term. I wonder where the echo is in this room. Phase term. Not to come from that speaker. There's a phase term ki dot r for the incident wave, kr dot r for the reflected one, and kt dot r for the transmitted one. And as usual, the magnetic fields for uh, each component, incident reflected and transmitted, are related to each other in the normal way, where we just note here that k here is the, this is the uh, unit vector in the direction. Now, at the boundary, okay, at the boundary, we made the statement that because the, the wave is oscillatory, the electric field is a function of time, we're all going up at the same time, we're all going up and down the same frequency, so they must match at any given moment throughout the cycle of that wave. So therefore, the phase must be the same at the boundary for each of the components. They must all be equal to each other. Okay, that's what this statement here says. So we're obviously considering the boundaries at z equals zero for obvious reasons, it's convenient. So if we expand that out as components, this is our, our next statement. Okay, expand that as components. Come on, focus, there we go. For an arbitrary orientation, of the incident wave with respect to the x, y, and z planes, we can write explicitly what the total phase is in terms of the amount of wavelengths we've moved along the x direction times the x value, and so on for the y value and the z value. Okay, so, so these three things must all be equal to each other numerically. So that arises because of our statement that we have a single frequency and all the phases are matched at the boundary. Okay, now, at z equals zero, I simply drop that third component. Okay? So away from the boundary, there can be a change in the relative phase of the waves. Okay? But on the boundary, they must all match up. So all the z values are equal to zero. So I have this. So ki x x plus ki y y must be equal to this. Must be equal. Uh, must be equal to this. Must be equal to this. Okay. All right. How are we going to simplify that further? Well, what we do is we rotate the x, y planes with, res with respect to the incoming wave. So this is our diagram. Let's zoom out a little bit so we can see everything together. Okay. So we're assuming that we have a single wave, wave fronts coming in at some angle to the surface, and I rotate the x, y planes to orient it so that ki lies, that vector lies in that plane. So this is the so-called plane of incidence. So I align the plane of incidence with the x-axis so that there are no, no longer any y components. Now if I imagine a 
a polarized, say, a polarized wave, say, with, has some electric field, which is pointing, say, normal to the Ki direction, we can immediately see from the boundary conditions that the, uh, the, the electric field must also be pointing in the plane of incidence for the other two components, okay, for Kr and Kt. Hence, we can deduce that Ki, Kr, and Kt must all lie in the same plane. Right? So we rotate, I've defined a plane of incidence along the x-axis within which Ki lies, and now Kr and Kt also must lie in that plane. So now, there are no more y components. I only have, for the phase relationship at the boundary, that Kixx equals Krxx equals Ktxx. And of course, I can now also cross out the x values. Remember that these are the x components of the number of waves that have elapsed or have been accumulated between x equals 0 and whatever value of x I happen to have along this boundary. Right. Now, of course, I can relate how many waves I have by relating that to the total wave number. Remember, this wave number is, is equal to 2 pi divided by the wavelength in that material. So the incident wave has a wave number k1, and because it is incident at an angle theta i, so that's this, to this normal here, okay, I can relate the wave number in the x direction to the total wave number by multiplying by sine of the incident angle. Okay. Similarly for the reflected wave, of course, the, 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 of course, the key thing here is of course that the incident and reflected waves have the same wave number because they're in the same material. That's defined by the propagation velocity. Right? Whereas in the, on the other side of the boundary, some kind of uh, light falling from somewhere, you still see okay? Yeah. Um, on the other side of the boundary, on the transmission side, in medium 2, I have a different wave number, K2. And of course, that will, that's the basic reason why there's a difference between uh, the properties of the reflected wave compared to the transmitted wave. Okay? So straight away from the first two equations, I can quickly obtain the law of reflection, which ties together theta i and theta r. And because of the change in velocity between medium 1 and medium 2, Relating the incident and transmitted waves, I can reflect, relate those together, and that gives rise to Snell's law for refraction. Okay. And just to remind you, to go from the, the, the expressions in K up here to Snell's law, we've used that K equals n omega over C for both materials. All right. So that's our general statement about reflection and refraction. And remember, we've derived all of that by simply looking at boundary conditions for the electric and magnetic fields. Now, we do need to look at different polarizations. So we said before, if we look back up here, let's zoom out a little bit, we can see it all in one go. So in our, in our, in our statement that all these waves, all the, uh, all the um, uh, wave vectors for the waves must, start, must lie in the same plane, we made the example of the electric field being transverse and pointing within this plane of incidence. Okay? And in that particular situation, I can tie all those three things together. And that's how I obtain that we had a single plane of incidence. But of course, the electric field doesn't necessarily have to point um, within that plane. It could also point uh, perpendicular to it. It can point at any angle. But there are two interesting situations. The situations where the electric field is within that plane, and the situations where it's perpendicular to it. And of course, if it's perpendicular, then the magnetic field is in the plane. Okay. So this is, OK, in the, in the, in the uh, Handwritten notes, the diagram's a bit messy. This, this diagram is correct, <laughs> okay? So there are two interesting situations. So now the plane of the piece of paper here is that plane of incidence, okay? So Y is out of the page. So here is my incident wave coming in. And in this so-called S polarized situation, let me drag that down a bit. Covering it up. It's further over there, isn't it? Let's see if I can cover that up. Oh, that's a little better, isn't it? There we go. Okay. So, so there are two interesting situations. We have the so-called S polarized situation and the P polarized situation. So the S polarized situation 
the electric field is perpendicular to the plane of incidence, and that's what, you know, these are the conventional crosses and dots. Yeah? This is the tail of the arrow, and this is the head of the arrow. Okay, so this arrow here, the electric field is pointing into the plane, whereas here it's pointing out of the plane, and we've already seen that is the correct orientation because if medium 2 is denser than medium 1, then if EI is positive and pointing down, then ER is positive and pointing up out of the paper. Okay? And of course, if EI is positive and pointing down, then ET is positive and pointing down on the transmitted side. Okay? So those are all our definitions of the angles. That should be, should be not really a big surprise. It's called S polarized from the German word for perpendicular. Okay? Zenkrecht. I don't know why I say that with a very German accent, but kind of fun to do so, isn't it? But there we are. Okay? Um, so, yeah, Zenkrecht means perpendicular because, of course, P is per parallel. It's always annoying when you have parallel and perpendicular both beginning with a P. So, P means parallel. So, in this case, the electric field is parallel to the plane of incidence. You can see it there. And, again, we've got, for the sensors where EI is positive, if, if this is positive in this direction, then ER must be pointing the other way on this side. So, I can eventually point it that way. And then ET is also pointing the same way as EI over here. And of course, you see the magnetic fields all swap around appropriately. The inter interesting thing to note here is, of course, because this wave is coming in, we know the orientation of positive EI and EBI e -B -I here. On the reflected wave, it still is positive when this is pointing up, and this BR is pointing to the right. Yeah? So you see that these two components add up, but these two components um, are opposite to each other. So we need to take account of that carefully when I write down the equations for the boundary conditions. But those are my two interesting situations. Okay. So S and P polarized. So in the, in the handwritten notes, I swapped them around by accident and I wrote a correction on it, but this way is the right way around. Okay. okay, so we apply the boundary conditions, and these are, of course, they now have angles in them which they didn't before. Right. So in the S polarized case, you see straight away that because the electric field is perpendicular to the plane of incidence, right, there's no angle to take account of. The electric field simply add up as they did in the perpendicular case. So I have EI0 plus ER0 equals ET0. Okay? But in the magnetic field, the magnetic fields do lie in the planes, so I need to look at the components of the magnetic field in the direction of the boundary and take account of that in my boundary, boundary calculation. And of course, I also need to take account of the fact that there are relative permeabilities, which we're labeling here as mu1 and mu2. And again, we put them here for completeness, but, we, but normally they're equal to 1, aren't they? Okay. So we have a relationship between bi0 cos theta i, br0 cos theta i, and bt0 cos theta t, because we know that theta i and theta t are equal. And we can combine these two equations together and allows us, it allows us to obtain a relationship between the magnitude of the reflected and transmitted electric fields. Okay? That's what this expression here is telling us. Right. We can rearrange that. So you can see here that we've, we've, um, we've put in Snell's law. So we've added in N1 and N2, which allows us to relate... Um, theta t and theta i, okay? and now we can relate the difference in the uh, reflected and incident electric fields to the transmitted electric field. What does this allow us to do? It allows us to calculate the amount that's being reflected and the amount that's being transmitted, and here, of course, this is for the S polarized situation. So it's for that component that's transverse to the plane of incidence. So this is a bit fiddly, so what we do is we use cos theta t equals 1 minus sine squared theta t, and we substitute in here, and we obtain the ratio of the reflected electric field to the incident electric field, and it looks like this. Okay. So this is rho perpendicular. This is the ratio of the strengths of electric fields. It's not the reflectivity r, which of course is the square of that number. Now you can express, you can write down that expression in a number of ways. There are several of these expressions. You can see this is one for the electric field for the reflected component. There is one for the transmitted component for the electric field. And there's also ones for the magnetic fields. Okay? And of course there's another four that do deal with all the transmitted components. So there's eight of them all together. And they're called Fresnel's equations. 
and you can write them in a number of ways. The way, a way I've written it down here is I've written it down in terms of the refractive index and in terms of the incident angles. If you look closely here, so I've eliminated theta t using Snell's law to express the ratio of, of, trans, of reflected to transmit reflected to incident electric field in terms of only theta i, the incident angle, and n here, which is the ratio of n2 to n1. Okay? See so if you can work through that to go basically from here to here. It's only a few lines working. Okay. You can also express it in other forms, which you'll, which you'll see in a minute. Okay. Now clearly if n1 is equal to 1, then n here is just obviously n2. That's another, that's another way you'll often see it. Okay. So that's the S-polarized case. The P-polarized case, okay. again, for simplicity, We'll assume a non-magnetic material, so we'll take here mu1 is mu2 equals 1. And now, of course, the magnetic field okay, is perpendicular. So in the p-polarized case, the electric field is parallel to the plane of incidence, so the magnetic field is perpendicular to the plane of incidence. And therefore, I can simply add up the magnetic fields across the boundary. That's my continuity condition. And when mu1 equals mu2 equals 1, they simply are related like that. And now the angles appear in the electric field. <laughs> So when I apply the boundary conditions for the electric field, and I go through the same rigmarole I had before, I get another equation which looks almost the same, but is different. It has an extra factor n squared. Okay, so you relate the one for the reflection of the this is the reflect this is the ratio of the of the uh, incident to reflected um, ways for the electric field in the s polarized situation. And here, this is the ratio of the reflected, the incident electric fields for the p-polarized situation. They don't look much different apart from an extra n squared, which has appeared in front of the first terms. Okay? Remember, the n here is the ratio of the two refractive indices, but often, of course, one of them is air, so it's equal to 1. Okay? So that is a, a sketch of how we arrive at the Fresnel equations expressed here in terms of refractive indices by applying boundary conditions. Okay. Now, we should think about this in another way. We had before some idea of having a, a wave impedance. And we made a, a statement way back in section two We'll see how these, these ideas are connected in a minute. Okay. We imagine I had, drop that down a bit, where is it gone? There it is, okay. Then we said if we had an oscillating dipole, if the current of the dipole, let's zoom in to make it focus, 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 there we go, okay. Come on, there we go, okay. If we had a dipole of magnitude i that was oscillating at some frequency, we would have a power that was emitted that was proportional to i squared. And the constant proportionality, we said, was like an impedance. And this was the impedance of free space. Okay? So we call this the radiation resistance. Right? And for our Hertzian dipole, we were able to express it in terms of the length of the over which the current was being circulated, being oscillated, and the wavelength of emission, we could express it in terms of some constant, Z0, which was our impedance of free space, as we called it. And we talked about this being mu naught c. Okay? So that was our free space impedance, and that was like 377 ohms or so. Right? Now, we can also write something else which we didn't do before. We know that in free space, we can relate the magnetic field to the electric field. The magnetic field is c times smaller than the electric field in free space. Right? And we know that b equals mu naught h. So therefore, mu naught h equals e over c. So therefore, if we express the magnetic field in that electromagnetic wave in terms of the h value, 
is equal to e over mu naught c. Well, mu naught c is just z0. So the relationship between h and e in a free space electromagnetic wave, the, their ratio is the free space impedance. Right. So we just swapped around some definitions of h, e, and b. Okay. So what? Well, let's relate that to what's going on in a dielectric medium. So in a dielectric medium, we can, we can write the same kind of thing. We can write down the impedance of a wave, or for a wave, in that medium, as being the ratio of the electric field that we generate compared to this H value, which is related to the magnetic field. Okay? And it's similar to the free space situation, except we, are, we need to include permeabilities and the dispersion, this dispersion relation here, omega over k. Okay? So when we calculate it through, okay, we can relate omega to k, that's, the, veloc that's the, um, the phase velocity. I calculate it and we can work out that the impedance for a wave traversing through a dielectric medium is the ratio of the permeability to the permittivity. Okay? That's our physics statement. Okay? That's important to, to get down. Right. So that's in a general dielectric medium. Now, of course, as ever, as, I'm, as I keep repeating, okay, the permeability of most materials is one, they're non-magnetic. Okay, so most dielectrics in particular are non-magnetic. So, so this very simple bit of algebra allows us to relate some kind of impedance value z to some ratio between mu naught and e naught and this relative permittivity. Now remember the relative permittivity is related, is, is related directly to the refractive index. So straight away I can write down that the impedance of a dielectric is equal to the impedance of free space divided by the refractive index. Okay. What does that mean? Well now let's look back. So we had before we had the Fresnel equations and we derived those. Remember we knew that the refractive index could be related to the wave velocity. That's where that permittivity term came in. And we derived a relationship between the ratio of the electric, reflected electric fields to the incident electric field and the transmitted ones to the to the incident ones in terms of the angle of incidence and the refractive index. Okay? So that's one way of writing those down. Remember there are eight of the relations and I showed two of them. They're the most, two most interesting ones of course, right? We can rewrite it in, these two, in this form. Okay, you probably want to get those down. So by rewriting the n values in terms of these impedance values, I can write down the ratio of reflected to uh, incident electric fields in either the s-polarized or p-polarized cases in terms of these now impedance values. Okay, so Z2 is the impedance in medium two, and Z1 is impedance in medium one. Okay? And again, there's a variety of expressions you can derive from this. And in this particular case, I've expressed it in terms of theta i and theta t, simply because it looks nicer. There's a certain symmetry that we can see. Okay? So you can see that across a dielectric boundary, right, there's a relationship between Yes, there's a relationship. I'm just checking to see if there's a typo in there, but there's not. There's a relationship between the impedances and the angles, which gives rise to the reflected, the reflected components either in the S or P polarized uh, cases. They do look identical, but they are not. I'm just checking that. Right? The bottom one is Z1 cos theta i minus Z2 cos theta t. Whereas the top one is Z2 minus Z1, yeah? The Z1 and Z2 have been swapped in the top and bottom expressions. You have to be very careful of that, as I was just checking. All right? I checked these a number of times, but it, yeah, they're very hard to get always right, but that's, those are right. So, so it clearly says that there's something different going on with the amount of radiation that's being reflected depending on whether it's S-polarized or P-polarized because of those boundary conditions, okay? Right, so what? Well, that's our general dielectric case. Let's look back at our conductor. 
So our conductor was a little bit different. So remember, in our conductor, we had the situation that the magnetic field and electric field were not a factor C different to each other. They were a factor V different to each other, where V is expressed here in terms of the ratio of the, um, the uh, angular frequency and the wave number. Okay? And we showed that in a conductor, we showed our dispersion relation reduces to this simple form. And remember, there was a 45 degree phase shift between those two components. And it depended also on the conductivity, sigma. Okay. And again, mu r is often emitted from that expression. Let's write that down in terms of this new impedance that we've just, we've just worked out. So I'm going to work out the impedance in terms of E over H. So the impedance is E over H in whatever wave is, we're in, in whatever material. So E over H is equal to mu r mu naught omega over k. And I can rewrite that. I keep the mu r on the left assuming it might not be equal to 1. I extract out a factor C, okay, and I get mu naught C, that's Z0. I keep the conductivity term, okay, and I rearrange it by extracting out the C and putting it over there. And then I get a factor 2 in here, so I've just, I've just rearranged this, this, these two expressions to try to draw out the important different physical components, right? So the 1 minus I, I've made it 1 over 1 minus i here. We'll see why in a minute. But that's equal to half in 1 plus i. I can rearrange this. This is the same as that. Okay, So I've just inverted e over b there. Okay. All right. What does that mean? That means, again, I've kept mu r here as we equal to 1 for the moment. So I now can express the impedance in a conductor in terms of the free space impedance. That's why I drew, drew out the factor c there. And a conductivity term that also depends on the frequency. Okay? And then there's a phase term. You can see this is now a complex value. So previously in a dielectric, the, you saw in the dielectric case above, we just draw that back down again. Where are we? It's up there. Okay. This dielectric case, these are all real valued. So the impedance in a dielectric is also a real number. Whereas in a conductor, when we wrote it, wrote it down, because we have this 1 plus i appearing, Okay. the impedance of a conductor is now a complex value. So, of course, it's expressing the idea that we're getting absorption. All right? Okay. Now, let's try that Fresnel equation again. So we had the, we had the theta i, theta t, and we had the z values. But let's look at what those will look like when we put them into the Fresnel equations, where we remember that our situation for a conductor was that Sigma was much bigger than epsilon naught omega. That's our condition for it being a good conductor. Right? And therefore, we see that the impedance value, yeah, because this number here is much, is much smaller than 1, we see that the impedance of a conductor is much lower than the free space impedance. Right? We substitute that into Fresnel's equations. Okay? And remember that this is Z here, this is Z2, that's our Z2 term. And let's talk about air, so the Z1 is basically the free space impedance, just for, for simplicity. And we get this expression. Basically, we see that the reflectivities are basically 1. Okay. Right. So regardless of the angle of incidence, both components are reflected pretty much completely. Right. And we can relate that. Let's relate that to normal, the normal incidence case. Just for completeness, okay? So we had our two cases. We had a dielectric medium, we had a conductor. And in the conductor, we saw that because the, it, it was a good conductor and that Z, uh, the impedance was quite small, we see the reflectivities are basically one for both the electric field components, which obviously means the transmitted ones are zero. And we can write down in general terms for normal incidence this rather nice symmetrical case. Okay? And again, notice that Z2 and Z1 are swapped around in those two situations. And the, again, those arise because of the boundary conditions. Okay. Okay, now I know I'm rumbling through this at a, at a fair rate. I'll just take a, a break for a minute for you to catch up. Okay. So 
So we see that we can derive the Fresnel relations, or the Fresnel equations, and we can write them down in a variety of forms. So I've just, given, I've just sketched this, okay? There are eight of them in total, and I've sketched the two which deal with the reflection of the S and P polarized components of the electric field, okay? Can we apply them in a couple of in interesting ways? And the first one, we notice, okay, let's uh, bring that down there, okay, let's zoom that out a little bit. Okay, continue, there we go, okay, now. So you can see that when when one of the impedances is small, you get um, you get complete reflection, right? But when Z1 equals Z2, well, that's like having two materials which are the same, right? So in effect, there's no boundary, so I should get complete transmission and therefore no reflection. So in the case of normal incidence, the reflected components, regardless of their polarization, should be equal to zero. Right? However, there may be other situations where one of those components, so, so in normal incidence, when Z1 equals Z2, I have, uh, I have uh, uh, both reflected components are equal to zero. Are there any other situations where one of them can be zero, but the other one isn't? Okay. Because in that situation, that would mean that that boundary would give rise to a polarizing effect. Right? One of the ways would be, one of the ways would be, uh, would be completely transmitted and the reflected component would only contain the would only contain one of those polarization components. Okay. So we we'll, we see that we can obtain that the reflected component of the p polarized wave that is equal to zero whenever we'll have the situation that the incident angle is related to the transmission angle. Okay by this relation. So I've substituted that 1 minus theta squared here. So now I have a relation that relates the ratio of the refractive indices across the boundary to the incident angle. Okay? Now you've seen that before. See, there's a small typo there. I'll get rid of that. You've seen before this situation. This is called the Brewster angle. So theta i here is the Brewster angle. And in that situation, the p polarized wave is not reflected at all. It's only transmitted. Okay? Sorry, let me rephrase that. I've been stupid this morning. Sorry. This situation does not occur here except when n1 equals n2. Okay? Right? So this one does not happen. Sorry, we meant, we meant to say the other one. The other one is when the parallel component is equal to zero, and that arises, here we are, that's the Brewster condition. Sorry. Okay? And here the Brewster condition is that there's a relationship between the ratio of the refractive indices and the incident angle in this form. Okay? Okay, now that equation is satisfied for incident angles which are related to the ratio of the refractive indices in this form. Okay, so the incident angle must, must be equal to 1 over square root of 1 plus n squared. Okay? So that is the Brewster angle, sorry. Now we can rewrite that angle definition by saying that tan theta i equals n. And that means there is a special angle defined as being tan to the minus 1 of n, where n is the ratio of the two refractive indices, and this is our Brewster angle. Okay? So let's draw that picture to see how that works. So here is a picture of what's going on. So this is the same picture we had before. We have the plane of incidence, all right? and we imagine the two components coming in. Okay? So the S polarization is this one, the one that's going transverse, and the p-polar situation is the one that's going this way in the plane of the incidence. So this is our incident weight, which we're saying is at theta b. And at theta b, the s-polarized case, so the s-polarization is being reflected, so that comes back, okay? But the parallel component, that's defined, again, this is r parallel equals zero, okay? The r parallel component is equal to zero, so that is transmitted down here, so that what is reflected is only polarized. Okay. So that's the, that's the statement. So light reflected with the Brewster angle is only S polarized. Okay. And that's because of our two situations. Just to recap, because I said it a bit confusing when to start with. There are two ways, there are two situations. One is when R perpendicular equals zero, and one is when R parallel equals zero. 
r perpendicular can only be equal to zero when n1 equals n2, which is not interesting, and r parallel can, can be equal to zero as long as I satisfy some condition on the incidence angle which uh, in terms of the ratio of the refractive indices. Okay. So that's the Brewster, that's the Brewster situation. So let's look at what that looks like. Let's look at two materials. Okay. So let's see how that works. So here we're plotting, this is for diamond, where the refractive index is quite high, it's about 2.4. Okay, what are we doing for time? Yes. Refractive index is quite high, it's about 2.4, and we're, we're looking at 589 nanometer wavelengths, because of course the refractive index varies with wavelength by some amount. But let's say I've got monochromatic light at 589 nanometers, and I vary the incident angle. Okay? And you can show by writing down those, those Fresnel relations directly, that's all I've done here. I have plotted out rho squared for those two components, the parallel and perpendicular components. Okay? So as I vary the incidence angle, you see that as I go to larger and larger angles, eventually I get complete reflection. Okay? But if for the parallel component, the, reflect, the reflectivity drops down to zero at the Brewster angle. Okay? That's when the theta arc, cos theta arc was 1 over 1 plus n squared. The perpendicular component does not have that behavior. So at the Brewster angle, the reflection, the, uh, the uh, reflected wave is only perpendicularly polarized. It's only p-polarized. Sorry, s-polarized. Okay? And that occurs here at 68 degrees. Now, for a different refractive index, the Brewster angle, of course, occurs at a different angle. But the other thing that happens as well is for a different refractive index, the total amount that's being reflected is different. You see above here, when I worked it out, there's a bit more being reflected at normal incidence. There's a bit less here because the refractive index is lower and the Brewster angle also changes. But we have the same behavior at large incidence angle that we have with a larger refractive index. Okay. So that's one consequence of the Fresnel relations. Okay. Now you see here, as the angle goes right up to 90 degrees, this is going from a rare medium into a dense medium, we gradually get more and more reflection. Okay, so another situation, of course, is the other way around, where I'm going from a dense medium to a rare medium. Okay. Okay, so the other thing that can occur is total internal reflection. So now, it, we, so we don't commonly do this, but here, medium one is now denser, it has a high refractive index, and medium two is rarer, it has a lower refractive index. So now that ratio that appears in the Fresnel relation n is now less than one. Okay. So that obviously means that there's a critical angle. So you've seen that concept before. There is a critical angle such that the incident wave um, is transformed into a transmitted wave whose angle is exactly along the boundary. Okay? So that critical angle is simply defined, as we've seen from, from Snell's law, as sine to the minus one of the ratio of the two, of the two refractive indices. Okay? So when we have an incident ray, which is exactly the critical angle, okay, we have a component, the transmitted component is along the boundary, there's nothing transmitted into the material, therefore the reflectivity must be exactly equal to one for both polarizations. Okay? However, there's something funny going on in this transmitted wave. It's not going into the material, but it's traveling along the surface. Okay? And we can write down its behavior in the following form. There is a transmitted wave, and it has an effective wave number, Q. Sorry, effective, um, um, that's the right way of saying it. You write down, yeah, sorry, when we have an incident angle which is larger than the critical angle, I still get complete reflection, but I now have a component in medium two which is somehow complex, okay? So we can write down a complex value for the transmitted angle. It's now equal to plus or minus IQ, where Q is given by Snell's law. Okay? So we have some kind of transmitted wave. And if we write it down explicitly, we can simply write down in terms of that Q value what it is. Okay? So it's just the same as it was before, where the transmitted wave has some total electric field. Let's zoom right in so we can see it. It has an oscillatory component in time. It has that same phase relationship, but if we break that up, 
into its two pieces, we can say it has a component along the x direction, along the boundary, and another component that goes into the material. Okay? The component that goes along the, along the boundary has a certain wavelength, which is determined by this theta t value, but there should also be another bit, which is decaying away from the boundary, this is z, dependent on this quantity q. Okay? And again, this looks like a, a component that's dying away. Okay? So this is what's known as a surface wave. Right? So that component is a component that has a wave number, uh, there we are, a wave number k2 sine theta t. Okay? This is a wave that's propagating along the interface between those two media. So this is for, this is, remember, this is going from a dense medium to a rarer medium. And we have an incident angle which is larger than the critical angle. And you get a surface wave. So the surface wave has a certain wavelength along the surface. And it also has an amplitude which goes as e to the minus k2 qz. So it penetrates into the rare material, but it's evanescent. Okay? So it has an amplitude that decays away. And again, similar to what we saw um, in, previous, um, in previous derivations, we can define a decay length, and not a skin depth here, we call it a decay length, whose magnitude is equal to 1 over whatever the wave number would be in material 2, okay, divided by this Q value. Remember, that Q value comes from this relation here. Okay? The wavelength, um, which is to do with the K value um, in that material 2, can also be defined. Okay? And this is, we can define a wavelength along the X direction, which is dependent upon the incident angle in the in the uh, denser medium. Okay? Now if we calculate, calculate what those numbers are, right. even though medium 2 is less dense and therefore we should have a faster wave if we, if we, had, if we had a proper transmitted wave, here the wave is, is, is travelling more slowly. Okay? So it's called a slow wave. All right? We can calculate explicitly what its velocity is. It's simply the ratio of the frequency, which is constant everywhere, divided by the wave number along the surface. So here's that picture of what's going on. Okay? Right. So here's our situation. We have a dense material, we have a rare material. We have an angle theta here, which is greater than the critical angle. So therefore, there is no transmitted component. But we can still see that there is some kind of uh, wave traveling along the surface and some amplitude, which is exponentially decreasing away from the surface. And we can calculate two things. We can calculate how far the amplitude of that will extend into the material and also the wavelength along here. And we say that the velocity of the wave that goes in this direction from that wavelength is slower than it would be if, it, if there was a real wave. Okay? All right. Now, that, the fact that there is... That, so you can see that within the material, there is still an electric field going up and down away from the surface, okay? away from this boundary. Whilst, it de whilst the amplitude de decreases exponentially, it's still going up and down as a function of time. So if I were to put in another boundary, so I have, a, a, say, two pieces of glass with a piece of air between them, I can actually see an oscillating electric field at this other boundary. Okay? So that's the concept of frustrated internal reflection. So this is the situation with, with frustrated internal reflection. I have, again, an incident wave coming in. It has an incidence angle which is bigger than the critical angle. So I, so I get 100% reflection, but I also have this exponentially decreasing term in the electric field. Remember, this is its amplitude as a function of depth, but it's also going up and down in time which means if I now have another dense medium here where I can now get back to having a real value for the wave number, I will now generate a real value to wave number here, real value to electric field going up and down, so I'll now get a real wave coming out the other side. Okay? So even though there is complete reflection here, I can frustrate that and I get some degree of transmission here, which must obviously subtract from the reflection there, because of the coupling by this, this, uh, this evanescent wave here between this surface and this surface.
So that's, that is the, the sort of physics that arises from that, the, that generation of the, um, of the Fresnel relations. Okay, so you've seen a lot of that before. I'm not going to really go into that much more now, but it's, it's useful to have covered. Okay? So I think that will probably do for today. So I've, I've, I've bumbled through that quite fast. Um, in the next lecture we're going to finish off looking at, um, um, by looking at scattering. Okay? And we'll, we'll, we'll pay a lot more attention to that on Monday, I think. Are there any questions, by the way? I've rumbled through that. Oh, good question. You can get that from the two frame of relations. This angle here should be the same angle as this one, shouldn't it? Yeah. If I've gone through from one medium to another, this should be theta i. I should probably attach that to the diagram, shouldn't I? Yeah. But that simply arises from applying Snell's law twice. Okay. And again, that arises because of our coupling between the two electric fields at the boundaries. <laughs> which I tried to get through quickly. Have to do it. Oh, this, uh, that one was for just uh, boundary conditions and reflection, but I'm going to go on to scattering, which is way more interesting. Scattering is ten times more interesting. <laughs> What's your one on? It's on map formation in nervous system development. Oh, okay. Map formation, Yeah, so how the different um, organisations set up so okay. the neurons are in the right place to buy it. Okay, that's interesting. Sorry, there's a weird echo in here. I don't know how to get rid of it. Yeah, it's that. Yeah. Put it in the wrong place. Yeah. It's somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway, cheers. See you okay. later. Morning. Morning. Or afternoon. <laughs>